Dr. David Bell, another Antipodean, originally from Australia, but you have worked all around the world, particularly um, a former World Health Organization medical officer and scientist. Can you tell us a little bit else about your background, please? Yeah, hi there. Um, okay, yeah, I'm a public health physician originally from Australia, worked in the UK for a while as well. And I joined the WHO for about eight years where I did the sort of coordinated malaria diagnostics and worked on in the early days on SARS-1 and various other infectious disease issues. And I led the um, malaria and infectious disease uh, groups at FIND, which is a foundation in Geneva on diagnostics and was director of global health technologies for global good fund which is a was bill gates lab in seattle but um these days i work in biotech and global health and you're based in texas based in texas for the last year yeah and what we're going to talk about today is what i consider an absolutely crucial article for everybody who's starting to lose hope around the world to read it's in the Brownstone Institute, and you are a senior scholar there. And it's dated the 4th of June, 2023, and entitled One Health, Subverted, Corrupted, and Ruined. What is One Health, this concept that, in your view, has now been absolutely hijacked? What is it? It's what we've thought for 100,000 years as humans, I think, that you know, it's the realisation that our health is affected by the environment. So. Um, you know, it, it originally, you know, it's it's holistic medicine or holistic health, the view of health. And, you know, 20 years ago, it was sort of the one health term was used to try to explain, you know, that if you have healthier herds of cattle, for instance, then you won't, you know, bovine TB, tuberculosis won't spread to the people using them. The, the cat, healthier cattle will be better for the, their economy, for, the, you know, their income, for their food sources. And so, you know, rather than just, as an example, so rather than just dealing with a human when it gets sick, you deal with their environment, their the influences on health that that make them sick, including animals, plants, etc. But I mean, it's been expanded now to you know, every in a couple of ways. One is the idea that um, everything in the biosphere affects us and therefore is a threat and so and it, it, this is being used in two ways one that we are a poison on the environment so the the climate emergency thing is pushed very much this way and so we are you know we pollute the environment as humans and then because of that pollution it is a threat to us and therefore one we have to be corralled and impoverished, et cetera, to reduce the way that we're polluting it. And two, that there's an existential threat from the environment on humans and we have to be, you know, managed or allow ourselves, our health to be managed in order to reduce that threat. So and, we'll you know, we'll pull all these strands apart. I want yeah. to get back to that herd, that herd of cattle. Let's take that simple example. You want a herd of cattle that's uh, able to withstand tuberculosis. So you're looking at the terrain. You're looking at healthier soils. You're looking at better water, cleaner water. Mm. So is it that idea of terrain, the, the terrain is more important, in fact, in some people's views, than the threat that comes within the, the terrain. In other words, if if we as humans eat very healthily, we exercise, we get enough mm. sleep, we look after ourselves, we build our natural immune God-given systems, then we will be able to withstand viruses and not have to succumb to all this fear that you're secondarily talking about. Is that correct? Have I got that right? That's a lot of it. Yeah. So we will withstand them much better, much more effectively. So, I mean, what you just explained is pandemic preparedness as we should do it, which is, um, you know, occasionally that we will have viruses and we'll have variants of viruses, bacteria, et cetera. And if we manage um, our health and our you know, immunity, et cetera, and then we will withstand them much better. And, you know, it's no coincidence that Almost, you know, the vast, vast majority of people who've died from COVID or with COVID were very elderly and had metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes, mellitus, et cetera, which 
And also that there is a very strong um, correlation with vitamin D deficiency, for instance. So, you know, the, there's an article in Nature not long ago suggesting that up to a third of COVID deaths could have been avoided if vitamin D had been normalized. So, yeah, the, the, being healthy and fit is an important part of that. But the, the other thing that's relevant, uh, we don't have the big pandemics like the Black Death anymore. They were mostly bacterial and they were very closely related to very poor sanitation, poor living conditions, et cetera. So again, we, we addressing those sorts of threats, addressing sanitation, nutrition, et cetera, is a much more effective way of improving health than you know, surveilling, spending tens of billions of dollars, which is being planned now, on surveilling for every viral variant that could potentially be in some way a threat, and then you know, locking down the population and reducing their health in order to address that tiny threat, which most of these present. It's so important in your article, you talk about how fear, basically fear and propaganda are used to mm. to stop people being able to critically think. But those of us in New Zealand who retained our critical thinking faculties said, where did Jacinda Ardern ever roll out health in terms of exercising and looking after our bodies? Mm. There was never that. And around the world, it was lockstep, just health at the point of a needle, or you don't have inverted commas health. As a former WHO uh, member of, of, of the World Health Organization, mm. were you amazed that World Health Organization went in this direction? No, I wasn't. I was certainly disappointed, but I wasn't surprised uh, because this is this hasn't suddenly happened. So, you know, the World Health Organization did put out um, its pandemic flu recommendations in 2019, which said don't do all these things. But... In parallel, there is this very strong push to move global health in that direction. It's not just the don't, World don't Health Organization. Don't do all what things, David? Don't do all... It's, you oh, said sorry. Don't do yeah, it things. says specifically, you know, explicitly do not close borders, do not quarantine healthy people. Um, and, you know, if you're thinking of closing businesses, seven to 10 days would be the maximum in a very severe situation. And the that reasons was in for that. 2019. That was 2019, late 2019, that was published by the WHO. And the reasons, as they explicitly say in the document, for not doing those things is because they will have very little impact and they will cause far more harm and specifically to low income people. So, this is exactly what happened with lockdowns. And, you know, we, there are a few countries that didn't have these strong lockdowns, such as, you know, we all know about Sweden and so on. Sweden ended up with the lowest all-cause mortality of the last three years in the OECD. And they weren't being radical. They were one of the few countries, Tanzania is another, there's a few others, that followed orthodox public health rather than following what was being suggested by the people who have recently taken over public health. Who are those people? Who is behind this? Can we name the names? I mean, no, I he, personally he, wondered when Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation became the largest funder of the World Health Organization. That really worried me and still does. Well, it is worrying, yeah. And, you know, but it's not one person or, you know, this is a movement that's been going over 20 years or more. The, the idea of public-private partnerships and you know, I was in WHO when these were sort of getting off the ground and it seemed a good idea. You have more money, you'll help to stop more children dying of malaria. And yeah, that works, it does. But what you forget then in the rush to get more money is that it, you know, corporations and private people, they give money for a reason. Now, sometimes that might be because they really care and they're altruistic, but generally, and especially for corporations and investors they're giving it because they think they'll get a return and you know the, the that they have responsibility to their shareholders if you're a corporation giving money to maximize that return to the shareholders so a pharma company will give money to who not to train more health workers and do sanitation they'll give money to sponsor programs that will increase the market Absolutely. for pharmaceuticals or vaccines so you know the public-private partnership idea, this sort of infiltration of private money and then private influence, 
first into the WHO, and most of this funding in the WHO now from countries and virtually all from private is specified. So they give the money to the WHO, not for the WHO to decide what to do that's best for humanity or health, but to do a specific project that the funder specifies in the place the funder specifies, et cetera. This is how about 80% of WHO funding works now. That's so, incredible. So it's it's funder directed policy. It's funder directed policy to a large extent. So you have the the World Health Assembly in the background, setting at a very high level, you know, the policy, etc. But in the end, most of the money, the seventy five to eighty percent of the budget, is given for us for the WHO to do a specific purpose. And if you're working in WHO, you know, often you know where your money is coming from as well. So. If you don't deliver what the funder wants, then you won't have the money next biennium and you or your team may not have a job and they have children in school, they have health care, you know, that they need to pay for, et cetera. So there are very strong pressures on everyone to please the funder. Can you contrast that, David, with WH, though, in the early days or even in the early days when you were working for it? Was it a far more uh, benign? Was it a far more objective, neutral organisation? Yes, it was. So nearly all the funding was originally um, 75 years ago now, but was um, from countries and it was core funding, assessed funding. So it's based on GDP. The money goes to WHO. WHO, um, you hope with technical competence, decides how best that can be used to fulfill its objectives. And they were based primarily on disease burden. So, you know, tuberculosis kills 1.6 million people every year, much, much younger than COVID. So that would be a much higher priority. Malaria kills over half a million children under five. So they lose 75 years of life. Whereas someone dying from COVID on average loses probably less than a year. So, of course, you would put all your resources in malaria rather than COVID. So it was based on those principles. And now, and there was a very strong, and it came from, you know, the end of fascism being overthrown, we thought, at the end of the Second World War, and um, decolonization in Asia and Africa. So there's a very strong push on human rights and on community-driven care and, you know, country-driven priorities or community-driven priorities rather than centralised. So, you know, what you call horizontal management rather than vertical management. So that, that was a very strong emphasis up to 30 years ago. Are you saying the money would come into WHO and then go out to the countries for each of their needs and groups in each country would decide more? So the, the emphasis was on strengthening these networks at a sort of community level. So the, there was a strong emphasis on, you know, access to very basic clinics, to very basic health care, et cetera, sanitation, uh, nutrition, and so on. So these things that we were talking about earlier. And so you don't make money out of that if you're a sponsor of WHO. You know, these people are, if you're a funder of WHO, but you, you, you would do it because you think in the end that, you know, doing this improves the economies of countries by improving health that, that allows the countries to get on their feet and be independent. It's very different from the idea that you would give a pharmaceutical for a problem and mandate that, et cetera. And so, you know, we've moved from this sort of horizontal approach, to this vertical, very centralised approach. So during COVID, we saw you know, the same policies put on Northern Italy as we, you know, as we were, they were then transferred to you know, places like Sub-Saharan Africa where half the people, half the population is under 20 years of age. They have all the, you know, a lot of other critical infectious disease problems. Almost no one was ever going to die of COVID there because less than 1% are over 75 years, which is when most people die of COVID or with COVID. And, you know, they have these uh, huge other health burdens. And, you know, this went as far as, you know, the COVAX program, which is aiming to vaccinate 70% of the people in sub-Saharan Africa. And WHO knew from their own study in late 2021, before Omicron, that almost everyone in Africa had already had COVID and they had antibodies to COVID. So we know from CDC studies and so on that 
adding a vaccine to that has a negligible benefit at best, let alone that half of these people are under 20. So it, there is no possible public health benefit that was measurable from this program. Yet it, it's absorbed seven or eight billion dollars, which is twice the annual budget of WHO. And it's still going at the moment. And you know, it's, it's WHO prioritised this. UNICEF was implemented. They're supposed to be doing vaccines for children, but they switched to doing vaccines for something that kills mostly in the 80s. And, um, you know, the Gavi, which is a, um, the vaccine, it's a public-private partnership just for vaccines. CEPI, Again, which is a public-private partnership. The Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's heavily influenced and started by them. Um, CEPI, which was started at the World Economic Forum by the Gates Foundation, um, Wellcome Trust, Norway and India um, in 2017, and just does pandemics and with a very strong emphasis on vaccines. So, you know, we have these organisations alongside the WHO whose sole purpose is to push commodities on people and vaccines, you know, have, have a place clearly in health. So it is good to have good vaccines for people who need them. But when you have whole organisations whose sole purpose is to do that, then you can see that that is going to skew public health massively towards just giving vaccines rather than because there is no organisation like Gavi doing basic nutrition or you know, micro, improving micronutrients or doing sanitation. So we see all this emphasis and all the money now going there. And the reason is, you know, and, you know Gavi has private, you know, corporate and so on interests on its board, so does SEPI. And the, the, for obvious reasons. So these are the companies that during COVID made hundreds of billions of dollars from the vaccine, more than they'd ever made before from any product by far. And so it worked for them. I mean, this has been an extremely successful commercial or business um, enterprise. As a money making enterprise, it has worked. But boy, as waking up the public, one could say it's also worked. And that would not have been one of their objectives. Many intelligent people now who formerly believed in vaccination are questioning it and saying, I'm not mm. sure that this is run ethically. Therefore, why would I put something deep inside my body? On Gavi, if, if I remember rightly, Jacinda Ardern in the early days of our rollout gave something like $20 million to that. And that's ridiculous yeah. when our country was just, is and is now languishing under the debt burden that she created. But let's get back, let's get back to this idea of, of health as a real... Uh, achievable goal for humans before we dive into the rollouts and and the effect of all this we each can david take responsibility from today for our own health can't we as a as a former idealistic who worker what would you say to each mother or father or, or, or grandmother who wants to be healthier today what responsibilities would you advise so we can be more independent Less, less inclined to have to follow this centralised model you talked of. I think I'm still idealistic, and I don't think my attitudes have changed. Um, I think, you know, I've seen things a lot more clearly over the last few years, certainly on you know, the, the whole vaccination issue, as you mentioned. And, um, you know, we, vaccination, we, we sort of put it on a pillar. And, you know, yes. vaccines are safe and effective, full stop. So if you question that, what about this one? what's the data on that, then you're an anti-vaxxer. And we've been trained to think anti-vaxxer is, you know, some sort of far-right, weird sort of, you know, untouchable type person. Whereas we don't think that for penicillin. I mean, penicillin, you know, one in 20,000 people or so get a severe allergic reaction to penicillin. So we're very careful. We ask in a hospital, you know, when we're going to give penicillin a medicine, we say, have you got any history of allergies? But when we give a vaccine, we just think everyone should get a vaccine. And we don't think, you know, do you really need this? What is the benefit? What are the risks in your situation? So we, and I, I think this has been drilled into us in, in medicine. So we saw this with questioning, you know, why on earth would you give a COVID vaccine to, well, 
to a pregnant woman or a young girl, when, when you know that, you know, a young girl is a, a healthy young girl is at far less than one in a million risk of dying from COVID. But we know that the mRNA concentrates in the ovaries. We know that from the animal studies that Pfizer did. So we, we know that the fact that the mRNA works by, it, it causes the machinery of the cell to produce um, spike protein, which is a foreign protein, a toxic protein. And then the immune system of the body recognizes that as foreign, recognizes the cell as foreign, and it um, kills the cell. And it forms a reaction against the cell and causes some local inflammation. So we don't know what that will happen, for instance, you know, as this is somewhat to the ovaries of a young girl. But you, you're born with a certain number of ova as you lose them. If you lose some, you don't get them back. Um, that means your fertility period is shorter. So we would never take this risk with a, a normal pharmaceutical, with an antibiotic, for instance. We, we would have extreme caution and we would get a lot of data from animals and a lot of data from other humans before we consider giving it to to children or to certainly a pregnant woman because we don't know what it does to the fetus. We know the mRNA crosses the placenta. So just give it, these are examples that we, you know, we just threw away all our caution with these mRNA vaccines. And we call them vaccines because Moderna called it a genetic um, medicine, which is what it is. It's actually a medicine. It takes over the machinery of the cell and causes the cell to produce a protein. So that's not what we used to call vaccines. It, it doesn't matter that we change the definition called a vaccine, except that that allowed us to not do the um, carcinogenesis testing, not do the teratogenicity, et cetera. So we, we didn't do or the genotoxicity. So we didn't do the studies that we normally have to do for genetic medicines because we changed the name to a vaccine. So that's extraordinary. It's pretty strange, but the, just clarify there, a genetic medicine means what? That it does well, change it means potentially that it is, the DNA? No, it's genetic material that acts as a medicine. So Does it change the DNA? Because that was a primary no. question, and so many people were told. Well, we can never say no in biology, yeah? Mm. It's very unlikely, but, you know, unlikely things will happen. We know that um, you can get reverse transcription of in certain conditions of, mRNA, of RNA into DNA. But there's a lot of conditions necessary for that. Uh, it hasn't been shown to reverse transcribe into human DNA. It's been shown um, in some, you know, theoretically in some bacteria under certain conditions. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It means it would be rare. But a genetic medicine is genetic material, which is RNA is, which is given as a medicine, which means, you know, a vaccine normally, you give a protein or a dead virus or you know, harm this virus. And that directly stimulates an immune response. So that's how a vaccine always worked. In this case, you're giving something that doesn't stimulate an immune response at all, but it causes this, it changes the way the cells work. And the cells then produce that something that does. So that's a medicine normally rather than a vaccine. So it doesn't matter we change the term as long as we still have the same sort of caution on a, something that is changing the way our cells work, especially when we know that it's doing that throughout the body. It, it's, uh, it's injecting the arm, but it's a very large, you know, a significant part of it is 25% or so on the, in the animal studies is systemic. So, and it concentrates in certain organs, but it goes to everywhere, you know, central nervous system, et cetera. And certainly in a pregnant woman, it will cross the placenta because that's the lipid nanoparticles are designed to go through cell walls. Oh, and then there's the issue of breastfeeding mothers as well. Yeah. And all this doesn't mean it's harmful. It means there is a very high risk and you would normally have this very strong um, level of caution before you went down the road of giving it to people who are at you know, almost no risk from the disease. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the fact that we threw all this away is really interesting and something very strange went on uh, because most of the medical profession just bought into this. And you would think after thalidomide and other experiences like that, that wouldn't happen. And we all thought that we were smarter as a society and that we wouldn't do this. But this is what we've just done. And 
you know, we're now seeing quite significant drops in fertility in a lot of countries from the, the start of 2022. So it's about nine months after pregnancy age women, childbearing age women started getting vaccinated. So, you know, there's a lot of associations that suggest there may be an impact on this. We know that there's some impact on sperm, for instance. So we don't know that, for instance, that it's causing infertility, but there is theoretical mechanisms that make sense, and we're seeing numbers that are associated that suggest it. So, you know, again, these would be red flags, as should have been the animal studies where we saw an increase in fetal abnormalities in the vaccinated rats versus the non-vaccinated. We saw an increase in pre-implantation pregnancy loss in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. Normally you'd say these are um, huge red flags that you know we would have to do a lot more studies. We didn't do any more studies. We gave them to women and said safe and effective. Uh, do you have any of the numbers on the the um, effect on fertility or on sperm? Do you have any of the statistics in your head? Well, there's data from Sweden, for instance, and you know, because they have good data, but Germany, um, Taiwan, other countries, where we're seeing about a 5 to 15% reduction in birth rates. And this is, you know, there can be a lot of reasons for this, but they're very unusual because they're quite sudden in these countries and they, they seem to be staying down mostly. So, you know, you can say that people are just depressed these days and so they don't want to have children, but it's unusual that that would happen quite suddenly in these countries. And there's a temporal link there with the rollout. Something, yeah. um, David, that was was told to me by a very educated woman who was rushing to get the jab. She said, no, I've seen my specialist. And he said, it just goes into the muscle. It's there for a couple of days. And then the body excretes it. To me, yeah. that was the most unscientific statement I'd ever heard from anybody. And yet here's a highly educated and very wealthy woman who was driving her whole family to have that believing a specialist. Do you think the specialists believed that sort of cant? I don't know. I, I'm sure there's not one answer to that. I think some did. Um, they just believe in, the, you know, they believe in their authorities. They haven't got time to read all the papers. They haven't got time to think about a lot. And they just, it's easier to just believe what you're told. Uh, I think quite a few, oh, I know quite a few didn't believe it, but thought um, everyone else was doing it. and. If they spoke out, they would be you know, there would be consequences. They would lose business. They'd be deregistered or whatever, which happened. So there was a lot of pressure to to comply and go along with this. Is there that pressure on you in your courage and your truth telling here now? Do you feel that as a pressure even now? No, I'm not working clinical medicine, so in that way, I'm fortunate, I guess. Mm. You know, most most of the been... people who've had trouble have been in clinical medicine. Yes, there's been enormous manipulation. So we've gone into that. What this did, we had a, a sort of cult, you write, in your Brownstone Institute article, which I highly recommend, and we will attach to this. You say there's been a cult feeding off fears, and these fears give a real potential for mass control. Can you explain that aspect of what you're writing about in this article? The cult part is a lot of the beliefs behind this. and so. There, there was an article in The Lancet um, early this year. There was a series on One Health, and the, the editorial that started it. So the, 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 quote, you know, the quote from that is um, health is... I, I've got um, it here. One Health, they write, will take a fundamentally different approach to the natural world. Mm -hmm. Everything has this equity, and this equity, world worldview... In this worldview, humans become a pollution. You alluded to this earlier, and I wanted to deep dive into this. It's a it's an article in the Lancet in January 2023. Yeah, so and they it's... don't say humans become a pollutant. That was my wording. But the, uh, the, the, they said that um, that all life, all being, all life is equal and of equal worth. Mm. And so what they're saying is that we should treat all life on an equal basis to humans. So your life and a rat's life are of the same value in this Exactly, view. yes. Yeah. And so you, you weigh up 
you know, a human person. And, and this this is a sort of almost a cultic thing. This is not, it's hard to pin this to any normal human culture, but it, it follows from that that you can, you know, you can put the environment and you can put other species above that of humans. And that becomes a very dangerous thing because um, it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't look after the environment, et cetera. And of course we should for all sorts of good reasons and we should preserve wilderness and species for all sorts of good reasons. But if it comes down to it, if you don't see humans as having a specific sort of sovereign worth over other animals and other parts of nature, then you're in a situation where you can treat humans as, as complete garbage, as pollutants, et cetera. And you know, all, all our sort of you know, ideas of natural law, et cetera, of good and bad go out the window. And th this is being stated quite explicitly by some of the proponents of this One Health. So it, it means that you can put you know, some abstract idea about climate over the, the welfare of humans, or you, know, you can put wilderness over the welfare of humans, you can impoverish a lot of humans, you can reduce their health and so on in order to benefit something else that you like in nature. It's very much happening in New Zealand, and that word that, uh, pollutant for a human being is very much what we're we're being made to feel here, that we're somehow a nuisance to the environment that we have. Yeah. Human death, you write, may therefore be justified for a greater good. And under Jacinda Ardern, unbeknown to many Kiwis, full-term abortions are now being allowed. So it's these these full human babies, these these sentient beings that are inside the mother can be aborted right up to just prior to birth, which is to many murder. And it has never been discussed publicly. It was simply introduced by Jacinda Ardern in a way that was so cavalier and so throwaway. It's chilling, actually. Well, it actually wasn't novel. So the WHO reduced, uh, they released, sorry, there are abortion care guidelines, new ones in 2022, that agree with that, that say that. So they, and they do this on a complete false understanding of human rights, but they, they say that essentially the abortion should be allowed without any need for, you know, consultation, et cetera, whenever the mother requests it up to the time of delivery. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting because WHO is supposed to, you know, represent all the populations of the world, but the vast majority of cultures and populations would disagree with this. This is, it's what we call cultural colonialism. It's not reflecting the cultures that make up the WHO. It's telling people what to do. And it's interesting because they also have guidelines on premature baby care, neonatal care. So. The, it, it means that WHO, and this is based on human rights, so that they say that you shouldn't even have counselling or a need for counselling because that might cause stress on the mother. And, you know, this is what the document says, stress on the mother is an infringement of her rights. And therefore, okay, and, you know, abortion is a difficult subject and there are, you know, I'm not tied to either pole here. Um but I don't see how a human can say that the neonate who came out at 28 weeks is human, but the baby that stayed in for another 10 weeks is not human at all. Because then the only thing that makes you human is the location that you're in. You're in the womb or you're outside the womb. I mean, your brain is the same, your DNA is the same, you can move independently, you can hear, we know, you can feel pain, et cetera, et cetera. So you can think in an abstract way. So had a 28-week-old baby, absolutely human, and treated as a human in the hospital. But uh, So I, I can't see that he's not human 10 weeks later just because a problem didn't occur that made him come out. So, you know, it's, it's a bankrupt idea of human rights and morality 
it doesn't mean abortion is intrinsically bad. Uh, we actually kill people in war. We accept that there are times when, unfortunately, we have to kill human beings. It's, it's not something that you do willingly. It's not something that is good. But sometimes you think there are a bad option and an even worse option, and we'll have to go for one of those. And pregnant women can be in extremely difficult positions. So I don't think you can make a blanket rule one way or the other. But what you can't do is complete, you know, pretend that there's not two humans there in some form, and therefore there, there is more than one person's rights. You have to face reality and then make a very difficult decision based on reality. So, you know, WHO, it's interesting because the, it's, Jacinda Ardern was just reflecting what the WHO is saying countries should do. And it, it reflects quite a concerning sort of approach to life and to health because firstly, it's illogical. And secondly, you know, it, it is just a completely arbitrary way of allotting rights to people or removing rights from people. And thirdly, I think, David, it was for many, I mean, many Kiwis even listening to this may go, I didn't know she did that. There was no public yeah. discussion. Previously, there was abortion up to an early stage when the cells mm -hmm. were still multiplying, but one could argue perhaps the sentience hadn't entered that human form. But as you say, I mean, I too have had friends who've had a baby seven weeks early, tiny, perfectly formed, completely mm. sentient. To think of yeah. abortion right up to the moment of birth is chilling in its, in its cavalier attitude towards human life, which is what we're talking about here. You say this runs counter to most human moral systems or natural law, and yet it's an ideology guiding public figures. We must, you write, understand this ideology as they are currently indoctrinating it into our children. I thought that was a very important part of your Brownstone Institute mm -hmm. article. Talk about that because we're looking at the gender ideology being inculcated into children, the gender confusions. But it's more than that. It's, it goes to the very heart of are humans valuable or not? I think it does, yeah. And I think a lot of this is driven by an idea that, yeah, that humans aren't intrinsically valuable, um, that we are just a biological accident, each of us. And we just, you know, there's some chemicals there that fire off, so, you know, cause some electrical impulses and whatever. A sort of but, mechanistic worldview that we're machines. We're kind of a version of yeah, a machine. machines or blobs of biology or whatever, or you know, complicated you know, bags of chemical reactions. And, and, and I'll just say there, David, what fascinates me is 20 years ago, to my shame, my chagrin, I worked in mainstream media when Helen Clark here was in charge, who has become a real UN acolyte. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Helen worked very, very, very hard to get all religion out of New Zealand, all understanding mm. of God, all understanding of a connection to a higher self, a soul, something beyond just yeah. this mechanistic life form that we are. And I find that fascinating that she's now a real mover and shaker behind the scenes, as are many of them. Yeah, it's interesting. The, uh, I mean, going back to that abortion guideline at WHO, the, um, yeah, it talks about, you know, inclusiveness and so on in the, in the process in the, in the introduction. But then it doesn't even mention religion. It doesn't mention cultural practices, you know, cultural concerns about it. It doesn't actually use the word baby in its 150 pages. So I bet it doesn't use the word soul. No, and it, it most the most common term to refer to the unborn, you know, to the fetus embryo is pregnancy tissue, which, which is really interesting because it what they're trying to do is dehumanize the being in the womb, which has a heart and has its own DNA and has its own thought processes and so on. But they're trying to say it's actually just a lump of tissue. It's like, you know, cutting off a mole. So if you go down this route, then you're back in. And, you know, it's not the first time that this has happened. And so we shouldn't be surprised at Helen Clark thinking this or whatever. The, um, well, you know, whatever Helen Clark thinks, but you're, you know, she's, you're suggesting she's going in the direction. The 
if you go back to the 1920s and 30s, eugenics was mainstream public health. The Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in the United States, it started on eugenics. Explain eugenics for people who are not familiar. We know that Bill Gates' father was a big eugenicist, but explain what, what it's what its thought process is, or I can't say morality, I can say amoral, amorality is about. What's its philosophy? On a, a general level, it's the idea that, um, the, 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 well, yeah, there's no, in just, there's a hierarchy of value of humans. So all people are not born equal, yeah? Yes. So, you know, it's best to look at the negative. So the, the, they don't think everyone is equal. They think some people have higher value than others. That may be because, you know, they're smarter, they're better looking, they're taller, you know, you can pick it. They're whiter, they're blacker, they've got curly red hair. I don't know. So you, you have a hierarchy of people and, you know, some cultures have had this as well as, you know, in caste systems, et cetera. And so the ones at the top are more valuable. They should be in charge, but they also have a right to control and even eliminate the ones at the bottom. So we saw in the United States, essentially forced um, sterilizations of women who were considered inferior because, and in other countries, because they were the wrong skin color, or they were single mothers and considered promiscuous, and we wanted that out of society, or whatever, you know, or they're just poor. This and was therefore in the they 20s. were considered of less worth and they wouldn't be able to look after children, so they should be sterile. Wow, this was in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Mm. And, and it came to its sort of apogee with, um, I suppose, with Mengele under Hitler. Oh, well, yeah, with the Interfering with Jewish children. Children with cerebral palsy and with Roma children and so on. And, you know, they had clinics in Germany where in the 1930s where people with cerebral palsy and so on and others considered... A, um, a weight on society not contributing would go in the front door and they'd never come out again. And this was not considered an evil thing by these people. It was considered for the greater good. So, and we have to, we have to understand that, you know, the Nazis were not all people in, you know, marching around in jackboots. They were um, progressive and they were from the left. Hitler, you know, Hitler and Mussolini both started on the left of politics. And they were seen as progressives and they had, you know, good youth organisations and improving health care and getting infrastructure running better and so on and so on. And they depended on propaganda and silencing any anyone who questioned. Yeah, because within that they had this hierarchy of human worth. And if you actually go down that path, there's so many ways to show that it doesn't make sense, that you have to have propaganda and you have to have censoring of those who disagree because otherwise you can't maintain this sort of structure. So it wasn't just in Germany. The technocracy movement, which was um, sort of part of this general genre, was very strong in North America, in the United States and Canada. It has something like half a million members, I think very heavily the medical profession as well, as the medical profession were greatly overrepresented in the Nazi party in the SS. So, and, and let's not forget the lineage through the royal family in England that the Queen's, the former Queen's uncle who abdicated was a very strong supporter of the Nazis, very strong. Yeah, but lots of people were. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is what we need to understand, that some of the attitudes and so on that we're seeing now are not that different from the 1920s and 30s that was moving in that direction. So we're seeing this discussion of a hierarchy of human worth and of a, a concentration of wealth in an elite, as we've seen over the last few years, and the idea that, I mean, we're seeing democracy massively diminish because, you know, uh, I mean, in America at the moment, the free speech is seen as a threat to democracy uh, because allowing people that you don't agree with that you consider inferior and you know stupid to have their say in society is is not for the greater good it's harmful and it'll hurt democracy because democracy is the system where what we think is best happens 
sadly that I think that's originated from Jacinda Ardern, who came out with, I am your one source of truth. That mm -hmm. one statement alone at the height of the madness of her COVID response really alerted a lot of people. This woman is not what she seems. And we have a massive propaganda department here in New Zealand. Massive. We think between 120 yeah. and 170 people no, pushing up English propaganda. English countries do at least. They, they yeah. have, yeah, a spy bee in the UK and so on. And, so, and they're behavioral psychologists. And mm. yeah, yeah, I mean, the idea of behavioral psychology helping a government in a democracy is insane because the government's supposed to be dependent on the will of the people. So to have the government using psychology to change the will of the people without them knowing essentially is i mean you can't get more anti-democratic than that we talked about one health is this pure idea and like so many things say jacinda ardern saying be kind and then she became one of the cruelest prime ministers we've ever had everything's been flipped so one health began as this pure idea of practical ways to look mm. after our own health and we will end on on that advice that i asked you for earlier but but One Health has now been subverted into this tool, in effect, you say here, a tool for manufacture of fear, and it leads to control. You write, humans must be corralled and protected for their own good. It's mm. so sinister, really, isn't it? Take away all our free choices, our free thinking, our free and open discussions, because yeah. really it's for our own good. Yeah, and that's it. Uh absolutely what we saw over the last three years and you know a lot of us thought you know i wasn't that surprised that people tried to do this but i was surprised that it worked so well and so it will happen again because there is now a huge movement from you know the who but the who is a tool it's not trying to take over the world it's a tool of people who you know these people who see themselves as superior to others and they're using the WHO and the World Bank or whatever, you know, other institutions to do this. So going back to this, this One Health idea, and yeah, I mean, one, you know, holistic medicine is a good idea. And yes, of course, the environment influences our health. So we should manage the environment you know, in a way that is better for our health. But that includes, it, do, it doesn't mean stopping a virus. It means us being better off. Yes. And making everyone poorer and locking them in their houses while you go jetting around in your private jet around the world. I mean, that's good for you, but it's not good for the majority of the population locked in their houses. So that's not One Health. That's something completely different. So we, 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 we can't let these people steal these terms from us and steal the ideas. So if you corrupt an idea, the, the idea isn't bad. The corruption is bad. So the people corrupting it are bad. Yeah. And and getting to those, we talk about corralling. How do they do it? It's a bombardment of fear. I mean, many, many of us mm. now are saying, wow, the, the whole climate fear narrative is bombarding us day and night through the media, which is so collapsed into the government because it's paid by the government, mm. the mainstream media. The climate fear narrative looks so similar to COVID now. You know, we have a bombardment yes. of fear. We have we have possibly the World Health Organization putting out a new pandemic or plandemic, as some say, and that they will try to dictate. Tell us tell us some of these other ways they're trying to corral us, as you see it, David. Well, I think, it's, as you said, the, you know, the, there's a very strong coordination in the media. And, and this isn't, you know, people say, how can all the media say the same thing? Well, they do say the same thing. There are good, you know, sort of montages out there of, you know, 20 or 30 media, senior media people saying exactly the same words. The reason is because there are, you know, there's Reuters and there's AP and the Y services, and they are owned by the people who own Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Google and Facebook, or the biggest shareholders in all those, which is BlackRock and Vanguard, the big investment houses. So, you know, they own all this stuff and they're using it very cleverly. So, they will put out the wires saying, you know, this is what's happened, this is the wording. And we see that coming out on multiple, what we thought were trusted media services um, the next morning. And, you know, there's a, going back to this threat to democracy. I mean, there, there was a catchphrase that suddenly appeared on the American media as anyone on the other side of politics to them or anyone that was against, you know, that what was happening with COVID, et cetera, et cetera, was a threat to democracy. Uh, you know, when you see these put together, it, it looks ridiculous, but 
you don't see them all at once so you don't realize what's going on you just hear it on the news service that you hear and you, this is pummeled into you like the climate agenda is pummeled into you of course the climate is changing there may well be anthropogenic influences but there is a whole um spectrum of opinion from climatologists on the reasons for the climate change and there certainly wasn't co2 in the middle ages when we had climate similar to today so there is a whole spectrum of opinions that we can't hear because we are only allowed to have your, your one source of truth and this is through all the mainstream media and through our institutions etc and in global health this works very strongly because the same people who are invested in the pharmaceutical companies are sponsoring the global health schools and are paying for most of the research and are paying the modelers and are paying newspapers like the guardian and so on for the global health sections so you have this you know package of this is what we're all going to say and it happens and if you want a job in global health you agree with this your career will do much better so you know th this is very much corralling and it's very coordinated and it's not surprising it's coordinated because if you look at the ownership of all these companies and the sponsorship of the institutions from the world economic forum down it's all the same groups who are doing this there's an extraordinary interview that Robert F. Kennedy has just done with uh, somebody who did the film Dimming, the, the Dimming of the World, and uh, we'll, we'll attach it underneath your interview. But in that, he Robert F. Kennedy was saying for years he has worked for to look after the climate, to make sure that you mm -hmm. know mankind is not causing unnecessary pollution that, that could cause discomfort to the climate. But he says that Bill Gates was never part of those discussions. He's only recently come in with this massive amount of money. He also mentions that Gates is very heavily invested in coal and in private jets. So yeah. there's this incredible hypocrisy that's going on, which roots right back to your saying the few who think they can do anything with impunity while they dictate to the masses, us, that yeah. we are nothing, the sort of... Noah Yuval Harari, World Economic Forum, ghastly, mm. if you look up any of his speeches, in which he does talk about people as useless eaters, that, that he has such derision for such, such disdain, actually, for human beings. So you can see that coming right through in Bill Gates. He's investing on the one hand in things that he's telling human societies we're not allowed to even use. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Well, it is extraordinary. It comes back to this hierarchy of humans, but it's not... I know it's not one person. This is a lot of people doing this. And so, and you know, in the end, I think this is more, well, it's, it's business driven, but it's an, it's an amoral approach to business. I mean, it's seeing profit as above all, but, and having no, you know, not seeing humans as any intrinsic worth apart from the fact that they can be, you can have, you can extract wealth from them. A sort of harvesting. So, yeah, so the use of Zeta's idea is that um, with AI and robotics and so on, there won't be a place to extract wealth from these people because we can do it cheaply otherwise, so therefore what do we do with them? We, which, you know, is, is the mindset that um, we are us and they are them and we're in charge and, you know, our right is to decide what we do with the others, which gets back to this whole view of humans. Uh, it's not we all equal mm. um, from birth, but it's the idea that some of us are, I mean, it, in a way is logical because if you see life that way, then it only makes sense to indulge yourself and please yourself. Because if others are just machines or biological lumps, I mean, it, it's irrational. To in a way to um, and I think that's where you've always coming from that it's irrational to treat them as something special it, it, because it's not helping you. And if life sort of starts at birth, stops at death, and you're you're nothing else, then there's a sort of logic to living that way, which is fascinating because then that could take us into 
thoughts about why it's essential to have an understanding of what many um what many so-called third world countries have often poorer people have a much deeper faith in something beyond here that we are briefly mm. journeying on this planet i mean even shakespeare understood this but that there is a soul in human beings and perhaps we're here yeah. on this planet to learn to refine to better our soul journey and those who don't those who are simply selfish here will suffer potentially in in other incarnations it it takes us into that whole area of the essential need for some kind of faith based living surely because it keeps us humble it stops us just being greedy bastards exploiting others on this planet what do you say to that they would say that that's a delusion and therefore people can live in their delusions but it doesn't change reality i mean the other way of looking at it is if it is reality then them denying it doesn't change that either um, and many would say they are delusional beings many would say the greed the inordinate greed what kinds of empty holes black holes do these people have inside them that they cannot stop scoffing up everything on this planet as much as they can take and even then it's not enough they're very sad in the end to me these beings oh absolutely and i think yeah i think they're deluded and it is sad I mean to see other humans as worthless beings is is really sad because life is so much richer if you see them you know as equal to yourself and of intrinsic worth and and nature is so much richer if you see humans as part of nature rather than a pollutant or rather than being separate from it somehow which they seem to so you know there are a lot of humans on the earth well that's the way that nature has gone and you know if you get too many elephants it causes a problem as well in some ways but you, we have to see ourselves as an intrinsic part of the planet and the, the biosphere and not as the biosphere and us and we you know a pollutant and a risk from it and yeah you know, it, it comes back to then you know is our whole role to avoid being infected by viruses that we're finding in the biosphere or 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 are the you know are there other things in life that are, are far more worthwhile so that when we're here on this earth we I would be happy to have a common cold or often to see more you know to see the sunset rather than not see it you know as a bad example but i mean no it's a beautiful example there is more to life than avoiding death and but if if you see death as the end of everything then that's not true and i think that is sort of a divide which we have to understand when we try to interact with these people because if they are seeing themselves as just you know lumps of biology and their only role is to indulge themselves because it somehow makes their biology feel better until it just dies and rots then um the, you know death is the end of everything yes there is no more there's nothing so avoiding death at all costs makes sense and you would get rid of many many others to avoid your own death yes because that's a logic but if you see all people as equal and you don't see death as the end of everything then you you know it's a totally different world view and it's almost like you can't talk to each other rationally because you will you won't understand you know they could never appreciate what you're thinking gosh that's a I remember years ago when I was on Radio New Zealand reviewing a book called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying and the opening paragraph never left me. He said in the east as it was before it was westernized. In the east um we believe that you are born and you are on this earth for a very short time to be a guardian of the earth and leave it a better mm. place than you found it. and in the and west that's quite a bit that's a judeo christian view as well exactly but he well, said yeah. in the west it's it's much more a belief of uh denying death trying to pretend death won't happen yeah. and the and all of the problems in the world root from that belief and there could be a much easier way that we could learn from those old eastern philosophies or as you say the judeo christian philosophies yeah there. i mean i'm sure it's not all the problems in the world but there's an awful lot of them and 
Yeah, and it's not, it, the West hasn't always been like that. Yes. This is a relatively new thing um, over the last, you know, perhaps few centuries or so, but it's particularly this century where we don't even talk about death anymore. We, you know, it, it's almost out of culture. I know lots of adults who've never seen someone die. And, you know, part of this is because children don't die. And when you see people dying, it makes you actually think harder about it. Yes. You can't hide from it. But, and I think perhaps it's, it's a good thing, but it's also a problem that we, we have so little contact with death now in the West and it's so institutionalised when it happens, you know. Yes. They're in a, a wooden box and it goes through a trapdoor and that's the end of it. So we don't, and we don't mourn and so on. We don't think about what all this means. It's fascinating. And when I say all the problems, yes, it's facile in a way, but doesn't greed, doesn't the lust for power, doesn't, doesn't that become the sort of very unhealthy seeding ground for most of our human problems? If we could share more, mm. if we could look out for one another, if we could have that compassion, that humility, really a lot of things that are difficult now, would we would find solutions. There may be pain, there may be suffering, but it would be done with a compassion that, that the, the world we have at the moment really is lacking. Yeah, it is. And, you know, the, the WHO says health is, you know, they define it as physical, mental and social well being. doesn't even mention spiritual. Um, which sort of encompasses that. Yeah, it, well, it's spiritual, but you could you could say mental and, and social gets into that realm. I mean, if you're dead spiritually, you struggle socially and mentally, I think. Mm. So... So it's it's this sort of it's a more holistic view. We we and you know going back to where the WHO has changed, you know they, they are making noises about mental health and so on. But in reality, the, they're locking people down. They're closing schools. They're pushing ten million girls into child marriage. You know nightly rape. They're increasing child labour. They're increasing infant mortality. So. They're doing, and they're impoverishing people. So they're doing the opposite. They're, they're taking away people's decision-making role. They're massively harming the mental and social side just for a virus and just, you know, again, I think it, it's hard to commoditize those other sides, but it's much easier to commoditize physical health with the medicines. And not just that, if, you know, we've had a huge push here from our, our Labour government for, for people to buy electric cars. And if you look at the mm. child labour involved in, yes. in cobalt and lithium yeah. that's needed for those electric car batteries, it is shocking. And never cheap spoken. enough that they're competitive, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. shocking. It, However, it's, it's like the, you know, the Belgian Congo. And the, we had the same with rubber in the early 19th, 20th century where... It was the same conditions to get rubber tires for cars. There was massive exploitation, unfortunately, in the same place, DRC, as it is now. Mm. So. However, your last part of your article will give so many hope. It comes back to some a phrase I love, David, is the truth shall set you free. And what you write here, it's headed exposing a cult. You say evil is not defeated by hiding from it. We fight it by exposing it and expose the ideology behind it, the greed, we expose the lies, we expose the deceit. And humans, I think there are enough still left who have, perhaps critical thinking has been taken away through the propagandist departments in the last few, year, few years of the, of the governments around the world, but we still have that lying latent there. And when we see the lies and deceit and the power grabbing, there is a potential mm. that humans in our millions and billions could wake up and say to these few, I don't call them the elites anymore, I call them the parasites, the few mm. parasites, the 1% of parasites. No, we don't accept your leadership. We don't accept World Economic mm. Forum advice. We don't want World Health Organization pandemics, uh, pandemic treaties. We don't want your philosophies. There is that potential still, is there not? Yeah, there is, um, of course. And yeah, I agree. I agree. The, um, what the basis of what they're saying is is garbage. It's stupid. I mean, you know, even you know, pandemics are not getting more frequent. Yeah, you know, the idea that there's more interaction with humans and wildlife is ridiculous. Unfortunately, we're getting less because habitat's disappearing. 
and you know the wildlife doesn't move into the humans it just dies so you know the, the you know the climate change is complex and we being we're being fed a, a ridiculously simplistic and um line on that that isn't actually adding up to the facts anymore as we see them you know the, the, the whole idea with yeah electric cars and batteries and the issues of supply you know is there even enough cobalt and how many children do we have to kill to get it so th there are so many flaws in this whole argument that eventually you know the, the weight of them will just bring it down i think that you know you, you can't build a house on lies you, you can get it to a certain height but then it's going to tumble down because people just start to see through it and we have to start complying with with stupidity and lies so you know we have to stop you know putting a mask on at a restaurant door and take it off 10 feet later <laughs> because you know i mean why do you do that the only reason you do that is because you're scared not to do some stupid thing that someone told you to do yes and so we have to stop being scared of not doing stupidity mm -hmm. we have to remember that in 2019 we weren't all dying in droves and from you know the next pandemic and we weren't terrified that the last even vaguely severe pandemic really was 1918, 19, it's over 100 years ago. And there's been two mild flu pandemics since then that killed less people than die of TB every year. You know, this is all built on rubbish. We, 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 we're not in an existential uh, risk from all these diseases. Uh, there are other diseases that are far more severe, they're far more of a problem. We live with them quite happily uh, for the last hundred years and we've at last we've been improving health and it would continue to do so if we didn't go and do all this stupid stuff so i think yeah people have just got, have, we've got to say that yeah i mean it's for the benefit of a few that's obvious we all getting impoverished as a result of it and yeah if people said this is unacceptable this is not democracy it's not the sort of idea of freedom and human life that we thought we were buying into when we accepted we're not democracy then all this would you know could go away it, it it's difficult because you know there is so much infiltration of institutions and media etc cetera, etc cetera. but in the end it comes down to um just refusing to comply with stuff that you think is stupid i, think. I love that and you and one of your final paragraphs you say I just love the way you write. The people running it are as empty as those in past times. Seeing the subjugation of others is the only way to address their internal inadequacies. Others go along for the ride to secure their careers and their pensions. Maybe they will stop going along for the ride. And I ask everyone who is doing that right now to stop and come with those of us speaking the truth. And then your final I think this this line will ring with me forever, David. In the end, mad ideologies collapse under the weight of their own deceit and the shallowness of their dogma. It is just a wonderful article in the Brunston Institute, and I would be very honoured if I could talk to you again on some of the other great writings you do, perhaps over the next weeks if we could, just to get no, people to following yeah, your you. writing. And, and it's so thoughtful and it's so well thought through that I believe it will wake up many Kiwis to the truths that have been consciously hidden by our propagandists here in New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, Liz.